different. Yes. 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 And we'll have a third event in early December that will look at arts and manufacturing. 
and will bring together some of those themes of artisanry and craft, but in a technological world, and, and how makerspaces and other types of um, environments for learning are helping to really elevate um, people's connection to each other, but by using new technologies. So we have been, it's been a lot of fun for us to be doing this project. We're just very grateful to partner, so I just really quickly wanted to call out Carnegie particularly for this event, Dan um, Hensley and Amy Welsh, who have been back and forth and are doing a lot for the fair now, um, have been working um, diligently on, on this project with us. We're very thankful to Heinz History Center, Amanda, as well as Mary Ruth, for putting together the workshop for educators and for Ryan Hoffman at Create Lab and other partners at Create Lab who's been helping us think about this as well. And Remake Learning, and we're going to hear from Cindy Chan, the director of Remake Learning, in just a moment um, as an advisory partner on this and helping us make these connections across different organizations that are here in Pittsburgh locally. Um, so a couple of quick notes and then I'm going to introduce our speaker, um, our speakers, plural, for, for this uh, lunch uh, conversation. Um, I do want you to know that there are, on the table there by the door, there are more yellow stickies and other kinds of materials to jot down notes and ideas, things that just occurred to you as you were listening to the educator workshop this morning. Um, so we can um, just get those ideas down while they're fresh in your mind. We'll be bringing some of that back together again when we talk at 2.30. Um, but we're also we'll documentation on that. As you can see, we um, have teams and students from the Pittsburgh area around us as videographers. And that's because Steeltown Entertainment is one of our fantastic partners on this project. We're very grateful to them. This is an opportunity both for Steeltown and its crew to be engaged in these conversations, but it's also a, just a really important moment for us to be able to have um, a, a moment to, to capture some of what we're talking about so that it can be used in the future. So, and, and I know there may be some people who do not want to be on camera, and so we're aware of that, and, and our crew also is, is recognizing that too. So, um, the materials that are coming out of these events, just wanted you to know where they're gonna land, um, and, and you all very much have, please you know, feel free to give us feedback and comments about how they will, will be used. We will be producing, at the end of all of this, um, materials that will be online, but also available through a, a larger culminating event that we're gonna do. Um, as a way to sort of stitch together some of the new ideas that have been generated, some of the bigger questions that community members have, and a lot of that's coming from our interviews that are on camera, as well as some of the uh, comments that come from discussions during the, the various events that we had. So that's why we've got some cameras here, we've been taking some photos, um, and we thank you all for your uh, understanding of that, but also your participation in it, because it's what really makes this a lot of fun. So my last note is that um, in addition to what we just described, on November 12th here in Pittsburgh, Participant Media will be doing a screening with New America is helping to kind of facilitate this of its new documentary. And this documentary you might have heard of, it's American Factory. It's gotten a lot of buzz. Um, the Obamas uh, in their organization are behind it as well. And so you have an opportunity if you live here in Pittsburgh to go to a dinner and a screening and discussion of that new documentary. And information about that will be coming to all of you as well soon. So I think that's it. I'm going to turn it over now to Andy Mink. So Andy is the VP for Education Programs at the National Humanities Center. And the National Humanities Center is based in is it Chapel Hill? Yeah. Yeah. North Carolina. But it is an organization that crosses spans the United States in terms of the way it connects scholars and its scholarship in the community. Andy's background for years, and he started as a public school teacher, has been how to use digital innovations to lift up new scholarship, but also help people understand it and like, you know, grasp it and, and make some sense of it. So I'm really um, thrilled to have Andy here with us. The National Humanities Center is a, a partner on this broader project with us, and we'll be hearing more about that. Um, in our next events as well. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Andy now. Thanks for being with us. Of course, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, actually, I should say. Um, thanks for having me. I want to thank Lisa and New America for partnering with us and inviting us to be a part of this. Um, but I actually am going to pause for just a moment because I'm having a moment. The very first class of kids I stood in front of, 27 kids, 
1992, and it was in a building in a room where uh, there were no windows, and the school is too small. I'm sorry, the school is too small for the kids, so we had to eat lunch in our classrooms. And right now, I'm having this olfactory moment of smelling your chips yes. and your lunch. It feels just like teaching those kids and having, having food everywhere and hearing the crunch. Um, and it's funny, those, that, those kinds of experiences inform everything, certainly, that I have done ever since uh, 27 kids that first period, 152, I think, that full day. Um, and ultimately, I think the work and, and the conversation I like to have over lunch is that connection between uh, research and uh, scholarly work and academics and technology with a much more practical approach in the classroom. So what I'm going to try to do for just a handful of minutes is try to maybe articulate that bridge and think about ways in which um, we can embrace technology or embrace computers or embrace these kinds of digital landscapes that we're all living in, but doing it in a way that, that matters for the kids we work with, the students we work with really at any age. At any point, please feel free to go and visit our website, nationalhumanitycenter.org. Um, National Humanities Center, as Lisa said, is located in Durham, North Carolina. It was constructed in 1978, and it uh, continues to be the only nonprofit, fully independent research center in the humanities in the world. So every single year we get a cohort of university professors. They apply from all over the country, and if they're selected, they move to North Carolina and they come to that building every single day, and they come to their own private study and they do the work. That work is research in a book project. That work is collaboration with colleagues and in interdisciplinary ways. That work is more increasingly digital projects. And these are folks who cover the full span of the humanities from history and literary scholarship to, uh, to uh, the classics, to art, to music, wh whatever that may be. And so, in many ways, the center is designed to advance our understanding of the world. And I really want to emphasize that point as we talk today because um, the humanities is often sort of put at odds with the STEM disciplines. And we often have to articulate the value of the humanities. And from my perspective, it's no, no less, and in fact, maybe more important than a lot of the other hard skills that we teach and we learn and we practice in our world. Um, technology and math and science, these things are super important about how to do things and maybe even what to do. But the humanities is why we do it. Like this is the, this is the point right now. And I'm actually increasingly optimistic in this complicated world we live in that the humanities will continue to be a really important way to understand ourselves, the way we position with other people and our community and the responsibilities we have there. So I think the work that we do, uh, 42 years later, nearly 1,500 alumni, every major uh, award won in all the major disciplines um, is really important to helping us understand that world. Our education department then, what I run, is designed to create bridges between that scholarly world and the classroom. And I mean classroom very broadly. We work certainly with K-12 education all across the country. We also work with community colleges and, and post-secondary educators how to infuse content into, uh, into the work that you do. So when I think of what we do in education, it really is intended to be very collegial, very side by side. We put scholars and teachers at all levels together to really try to understand how, how, how content, how, how scholarship can, uh, can affect teaching practice. Um, some of you will remember this. It really is about more you know, right? I mean, no matter how confident you are as a teacher, if you want to navigate the complexities of standing in front of all these students of any age, the more you know, the more, the more able you are to do those things and make those kinds of choices and allow things to be a little bit more open-ended. From that process and all the initiatives that you can find on our website, uh, we develop content. And that content is designed to be open and free, and it's designed to be applicable, again, to really any classroom uh, that, that handles uh, the humanities in a both curriculum and extracurricular way. Then I think ultimately what this is intended to do is uh, build advocacy for the humanities. These aren't extra things you do when everything else is done. Um, aesthetics, beauty, civil discourse, understanding our identity, understanding culture, uh, recognizing marginalized voices. These are really important facets of our democracy. It's not extra stuff, but rather really critical uh, work that we do. And that advocacy, I think, is just constantly reaffirming and reminding all of us why these, these subjects and these disciplines matter. So I'm actually not going to talk to you much at all about technology in the next uh, handful of minutes. I'm not going to really talk about the, the gadgets and the programs and the software much, although those are super important expressions of what we try to do in the humanities. What I'm going to talk to you about is geospatial thinking. 
Because from my perspective, it's more about how we think geospatially than what the tools may do for us or what a map, if you open in a book or scroll roll down off that ceiling, uh, that big roll that they used to have and pull the maps down. Maps are not two dimensional objects. They're not uh, facsimiles of the real world, right? They're not, they're not Polaroids that we take of the world and we show and go, huh, this is exactly what it is or where things are. Maps, it seems to me, tell stories. And that's what the humanities do, is give us a vocabulary for telling stories. So take a look at that map. What do you guys think that's a map of? Land, okay. What's that a map of? What's it displaying? What are the, what's the symbology, do you think? What kind of material is it on? It's a what? It is, that's exactly right, it's a deer skin. So what do you think these circles and these lines and these sort of abstractions, what do you think they represent? Definitely communities, so you see native names in most of the circles. There's a big square down here that says Virginia. And then there's a series of much more symmetrical lines here. You likely can't read this because it's facing me that says Charleston. What do you think this is a map of? Oftentimes when we give maps to younger students, they immediately think that maps show you how to get to places. Mm -hmm. Is this a map of destination? Mm -hmm. Like how to get somewhere? I don't think so either. I think the scale is completely off. <laughs> Virginia and Charleston are not nearly <laughs> that far apart. So what do you think it's showing? The native communities mm -hmm. and reference to one another when they living. Yes, and? And, and not, but not necessarily location of where they're living. Okay. So I don't know that, that, right. that this, that the Cherokees are necessarily living next yeah. to right. this one, right? But, but you're right, it is a native community. But, mm -hmm. but they're all sort of equal sizes, not all. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of scale to the groupings that they've done. But what do you think the connections are between those circles of lines? Alliances. Alliances for sure, around what in particular do you think? Trade. Trade. It's a trade map. So this is a map that tells uh, the English how they can trade with different natives. And you basically have to follow the lines that connect. You can't get to this tribe unless you go through this one. You can't talk to and negotiate with you know, one of these unless you go down the path. So it's actually a map of trade relationships and the ways in which these communities uh, interact with each other, uh, the kinds of Symbology, I'm sure, uh, also indicates some kind of sacred space or some kind of hunting space or some kind of, um, of directions on how you can approach if you were to engage with uh, any of these tribes at any given point. So in 1725, it was really important to know who you could trade with, who you could trust, who you could go through, where that alliances might be. So this map has nothing to do with where things are. It has nothing to do with the scale and the distance between things. It's all about the relationship between people. And you're right, it was, I think you said, somebody said it's a deer skin, so it rolled up. That's where you see the creases. You kind of draped on the back of your horse maybe or carried into your arm. And you, when you get somewhere, you kind of boom, unfurl that thing and try to figure out who you can speak to. This is the earliest social network right there. This is a map uh, from the similar collection from the National Archives in the UK. This is a map, of, a new map of uh, Carolina, North Carolina in this case, along the Cooper River, the Ashley River, which is just above Wilmington. What's interesting about this map to me is that in this case, there is a location, right? There is some sense of physical and geographical representation. But what's really important about this map are the names of the families who own the land. So if your name was put there, you're at the top of the bracket. But if someone chose to leave your name off, or if someone chose to erase it the next time they made it, then you're not part of that system anymore. And in fact, many of the streets and the towns in this area still, still have these family names. In other words, it's a map that um, legitimizes or a map that documents the importance of land ownership and families and the relationships between them. Sure, it shows you where things are. This is about who people are. This is about who the, who the cool families are, who the important and, and um, uh, sort of class-based families are. 
So one of the things that seems important to me to do with maps and geospatial thinking is to recognize that they're not facsimiles in most cases. They're interpretations of the world we live in. They're the things we find important. They're the ways we want to tell those stories to other people so that they can then, um, so that they can then uh, acknowledge that or play by those rules or somehow contribute to it. So geospatial thinking to me is not a dot on a map, although certainly putting things by location is important. Seeing change over time and place is important. Seeing relationships between places are important. But it is more than a dot. Here's an example. You guys know where that is? Where do you think that place is? Underneath that yellow dot, where is that? You can even start by just looking at that. Where's that? Search where? Close, but not. I'm sorry? It is DC. So that's Washington, D.C., says the person who's from D.C. <laughs> so how did you know it was from D.C. without having been from D.C.? Are there things on there that you recognize? Me? Whoever said D.C., what do you see, AJ? So what do you see that, that, rec that you recognize that to be D.C.? So, so okay, so you see the mall and you see the... Okay. All right, smarty cat AJ, where's that? Where's that then, since you live there? Nope, it's close. Nope, close. Nope, close. Keep going. Nope, close. That's the Washington Monument. Right? So there is a very specific, very concrete location, an absolute location of that place. Right? We can put our finger on a map and say that's where the Washington Monument is. We can take a picture from above. We can walk and stand right there at those coordinates. We can. Uh, use those phones that are giving us cancer in our pockets right now to mark that and say this is exactly where we are. So there is a location to geography. But that dot also has other qualities. And this is the story that I think is more important and more interesting. And this is where communities and neighborhoods and place uh, really start to converge. That dot has characteristics like context. Why was it put there? Why was the Washington Monument constructed in this place, in this manner, with this neighborhood, with this urban planning? The dot becomes a place with connections with other places, illusions, um, similar constructions and intent. It becomes a place that has a history. There's a whole history of the construction of that spot, of that location. Uh, as many of you know, when you go to the Washington Monument, you can see it change color about eh, a little over halfway up. You guys know where that is who don't live in DC? Do you know why? Please give me the answer. Uh, I've been waiting for you to come up with an answer because I saw you, I've been seeing you churn. But because during the Civil War, yep, yep. after the Civil That's War, right. the materials they used yeah. changed because of money? Uh, that's exactly right. And they changed it to a different color marble. So you can go and actually see the line right where the Civil War started and ended. That's a great answer. Thank you. A place like this has memories and experiences. People who go there and experience things and document them in a, a variety of ways. Places, a very particular location, often changes because of physical uh, events like the earthquake in 2011 with the epicenter in Louisa, Virginia, still created cracks. It's a place of celebration and commemoration. It's a place of national narrative and story. But it's also a place of individual story. And it's a place of destination and marginalization. So all of these layers are happening in this one single dot on the map. And that's the story that we're actually trying to capture. And that's where the tools that you've been shared with, in my view, can really kind of capture that story and bring that forward. It's telling the story of the place and its location and its relationship to other places. Um, it's pinpointing exactly why that place matters and the alchemy that happens when certain events occur. It's, um, it's a way to see its connection and its relationship to humans and community and conversation and successes and failures. It really does become more than a dot. And so when you think about working with maps and geography, it's not about um, 
maps in your textbook that you kind of look at and find the answer. It's a place of interrogation and inquiry. It's a place where questions really drive that use. So here's my last point. How do you get those stories? So if you've got these big fabrics of communities, um, all these things happening over time and place, and you're trying to capture that to put into some kind of mapping visualization, what are good ways to do that? One way is we do it at the National Humanities Center is through a project we have called the Humanities Moments Project. So this project was started three years ago, and it was inspired by our current president, Robert Newman, when he gave his inauguration speech. He used this phrase, and I think he did it sort of offhandedly, humanities moment, lowercase h, lowercase m. And he described three times in his life in which something in the humanities helped him clarify his purpose and bring uh, value to his identity and help him sort of get something. It was like, it was a bam. It was a moment where he really sort of understood something. And so he decided to ask other people if they've had similar moments. And of course, most, if not everybody has. Um, as you move through your life, regardless of your age, you can look back and say, you know what, that book gave me a vocabulary for an experience I never would have had otherwise. Or that painting, or that piece of music, or that Metallica song, or, I see you with your shirt on, or these things that sort of inform who you are and they give you just a special lens and we ask people to give those to us into a, uh, a crowdsourced archive. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the site, humanitiesmoments.org, and you can see individual moments from a variety of people, both well-known and famous and celebrity, as well as just everyday people who are thinking this. Um, all of the moments are geotagged, so we can see where they occurred. But even that's not accurate, because that's interpretation. You put the geotag where you had the moment, or where the moment you had the moment about occurred. And there's an interpretation, right? It's all sort of you telling a story. But we put it into a map, we start to see connections, we keyword it so that we can um, see the trends and the connections. We have audio, video, and text-based moments. And then we can start making collections. And it's really pretty powerful to see that uh, a certain place, like the Washington Monument, or um, the incline view in Pittsburgh, or a particular piece of art or, uh, or literature has encouraged this kind of of moment. For those who struggle to put words on this, and I find that particularly really younger people do because they haven't had enough life experience to really be reflective like this, I think it's also helpful to give them moments as third person examples. Here's what someone else thought and felt when they heard this speech or they read this passage or they did this piece of poetry. And so I do think it's got value in, uh, instructionally in both a uh, production way and it's also a review way. So we invite you, and we're going to be working, I think, in the community of Pittsburgh to harvest people's moments as a way to show commonality in communities, a way of showing connections of what people have gone through, particularly if this is their home place. And we do want to put those into a map to visualize that and start to show the connections and the impact of these moments on the broader community. Um, I'm going to leave you with just a couple of resources, particularly if you're an educator, that we do have in terms of geospatial thinking and geography. That includes a whole variety of online resources, uh, free and open, that have both media and, uh, and curricular basis. Uh, we do offer online courses in ArcGIS and StoryMap. Uh, these are five-week courses in which you can actually learn the nitty-gritty of the buttonology of uh, StoryMap, but doing so in, this, in the narratives of the humanities. And this coming week, actually, it's likely far too soon and far too far away for folks in this room, but we do on-site trainings in GIS as well, and we'll be doing one this coming week with scholars and teachers in North Carolina. So all that's to say that uh, geography, in my view, is a super important vocabulary of the humanities, and if you're interested, I'd love to uh, follow up with you when the time comes. So thank you for having me. What time, Lisa? So maybe like five minutes or so? Oh, that is perfect. Because I'd love to have some questions, some time questions as well. Should we have one? The really is the economic perspective. That's, the one. that's at 1 p.m. OK. Yep. Yep. And that's going to be across the hall. Yes. Great. OK. Um,
Five minutes. Yo, I know so many of you already. <laughs> that I was like, I looked at the attendee list for today before I got here, and I was like, I am not going to do you the like, what is remote learning? Most of you, if not all of you, know what remote learning is. So instead, I like, I dropped the slides, and I thought for five minutes, let me think about how I think of remote learning as a map, because um, you've been thinking a lot about maps today, and how. You know, we at the Remake Learning Court and the Social Team like, really think about um, a network as a map of social relationships, and then also what's missing from the Remake Learning Network and what's missing and who's missing from that map, um, both historically and currently. And so I'm actually going to um, thank you, Dan. Where did Dan go? For helping set this up, because I um, did not have any uh, slides. And so they, they were really kind to kind of throw on this whole contraption, let me borrow a computer, so appreciate that. Um, so what I want to do actually is I'm going to start by showing you some maps that you might not know that we have. Um, one that I often show people, which is at remakelearning.org slash maker, is a maker map. It's a, and it's way at the bottom of the website, so I feel like people don't always know that it's here. But this is a map of a bunch of Pittsburgh maker spaces that we've compiled over time. Maker spaces at museums, libraries, out of school programs. We know from the network that there are over 200 educational maker spaces in the Pittsburgh region. And if you zoom out, you can really see where a lot of those are um, in Pittsburgh. And you can see here that we categorize them by higher ed, museum, intermediate unit, PD space. And when you click on one of these, you can see exactly where it is. Um, depending on the information, you can also see contact information. Depending on the point, you can also see um, the type of tools and materials that are available in this space. It's a really local resource. Um, this map makes me think of two things. One, it makes me think of the fact that um, it's not updated as much as we'd like it to be, right? I think part of the challenge with mapping is that it takes a lot to update it. It takes new information and new sources of data, and it takes human capital to really dig into, um, to dig into, you know, being able to update it and make it frequent. So we know, for instance, that there are new major spaces that have popped up in the Hill District that are not located on this map, and that's something that we have to continuously work on trying to figure out how to update. Um, and I know also that there are a lot of maker spaces on this map that are no longer there or no longer active. And so how do we continue to, to make that relevant? Um, another thing that I, that I know about this map is that, um, is that not as many people access it as we'd like. So we have data on how many people access it. And so we're always thinking about, you know, we're collecting all this information from a whole community perspective and trying to figure out how to communicate that map in a way that makes sense for educators, in a way that folks can actually use is something that we always have a struggle with. Sometimes we're more successful than others. Um, I think about another map when I think about mapping and remake learning. Um, I think about a map that uh, Latrenda helped create for computer science. And you know, maps come in all kinds of different forms. So that was more of a geographic map that we're used to. Latrenda helped create um, a map of computer science programs in the region, which we categorized into this publication called the Quick Start Guide. If you scroll through this guide, you'll see a bunch of kind of one-page case studies about different ways in which computational thinking has been, um, has kind of popped up in the Remake Learning Network at museums, at schools, at libraries. You'll be able to see the cost, the time, the people, kind of the step-by-step -step instruction. Um, and what I love about this is it's a different kind of map. There are about 25 case studies here. It's not a geographic map, but it's certainly a map of different types of resources and stories in the Remake Learning Network over time. Um, and you'll, what I love about this, too, is it's also kind of a map of people. You can actually connect to the person in Pittsburgh who's doing this work and get advice on how to do it yourself. And so another thing that I, that I personally love about Remake Learning and about doing this work is that something a network can do is say, what are all different types of organizations doing across Pittsburgh? And how do we bring that together um, and showcase and celebrate and be of service to all the amazing educators who are doing work in this region? And so um, a different kind of map. And also with a lot of the same challenges as the other map I just showed you, the makerspace map, right? Um, how does this get updated? How do we make sure that the content is, continues to be refreshed and relevant? How do we make sure that the contact information for the people here continues to be refreshed and relevant? That's something that Latrend is thinking about right now. I mean, this came out a year ago, and already there are things that we need to update, right? Um, so another map, another way that maps can be useful is that in Pittsburgh, they can connect people who otherwise weren't connected. So um, 
Another map that you might not know about that's on our rural page, so this is a space entirely devoted to the rural parts of the network outside of Allegheny County um, that my colleague Allie manages. Um, and Allie has a map down here of all of the rural parts of the network. So um, everyone that she's contacted in, uh, in the Pittsburgh region that uh, is kind of part of the remote learning network that she's been able to get in contact with is on this map. And you can kind of see, it's not all rural, but it's mostly folks who are outside of Allegheny County in some of these rural areas. And what's awesome about this map is, you know, it's not just schools, museums, libraries, but it's also food banks and community centers and places that um, are kind of outside of the traditional quote unquote learning space that she's been able to really bring into the network in beautiful ways. And similarly, um, if you click on any of these, you can see a little bit more information about them. Um, and obviously contacting Ali will help make connections to any of these places. So again, how do we figure out, you know, both, once you get it on a map, how do we figure out how to get it to more network members and make sure more of those connections are being made is, and make sure it's continuously updated is a challenge that, that we often have. Um, one other type of map I want to show you before, well, two more maps I want to show you before we go from the Remake Learning standpoint. Um, raise your hand if you are a member of the Remake Learning Network, like on the directory. I know, yeah, cool. So a few, a few of us are um, in the room. So what I love about this particular map is that um, if you're a teacher in a classroom who's doing a PBL workshop or who's doing a, you know, content on a specific thing and you want to know who are the other people, you know, I really want an industry partner to help with this. You can actually um, look at the member category, select a private company, and suddenly you have a filter of a bunch of people who are working at companies if you wanted to connect to an industry partner, right? Um, who are at least on the website as part of the network. Um, let's say you wanted to find somebody who had a specific interest area in youth voice, let's just say. Um, you can connect to people who have selected that as their interest area too. And there are phone numbers and email addresses and it's not perhaps a social network analysis kind of like um, well, what Andy was showing earlier in terms of bubbles and how people are connected. But at least it's a, a slight map of the community um, and, and kind of what people are interested in. Of course, it's not an entire map of the community. And there are a lot of people that are missing from this directory that, um, that are just not included in this ability to search and find people on the website. So we think about the Remake Learning Network and really deepening and making those connections more, um, more inclusive and more um, intentional. A lot of what we think about on uh, an infrastructure team is moving from saying this is an open network um, to saying like how do we be intentional about bringing people into the network who have been historically and currently marginalized and oppressed, how can we be more um, supportive and more inclusive and more in service of educators in the network who don't appear in this directory um, for various reasons. And so while this is an incredible resource and an incredible map, we're constantly thinking about what is missing from all of these maps that we have and how do we create more intentionally inclusive maps of our community. Um, and so, you know, I don't have an answer for that right now. Um, and I, I throw it out to you as people who uh, have been parts of the network for a really long time to, to also help us think about, you know, all of these maps and all this information we're collecting on the entire learning ecosystem and learning community and how we can do that better. So part of this is like me telling you what's going on, um, but I'm sure you already know a lot of this and most of it is actually just saying, can you actually help us think about this because you all are part of this community as well. Um, the last map that I thought about when I was preparing for this was a map of stories. So another kind of map that we have is the blog. And this, this blog has been kind of in creation since, I don't know, Greg's here, 2011 or something. We've been having stories for a really long time. And um, I thought a lot about, like, how are stories maps? Um, and how can we look through the entire kind of, you know, history of the stories that we've told and see how language has changed, see how thoughts have changed, see how topics have changed as a way to map the history of the network and the map the history of what our network members have been doing and to map the history of who network members are. Um, and so, um, you know, my colleague Ani talks a lot about how she really wants a remake learning librarian or a remake learning archivist to be able to go back into all of this historical data and information um, from the last, you know, 12 years that remake learning has been around. And to really take a look at both how, you know, the stories have changed and how things have been different, um, but also kind of how 
um, how we talk about things differently and how that's also kind of a map. And, you know, again, you know, I don't think this is, I only have five minutes, so I know it's not the time right now to kind of ask for your input, but I would hope that folks in the room would think about that and give us your input. Like, what are the things that um, you still don't see in our storytelling? What are the things that we need to have more of a perspective on as we map stories, as we map places, as we map the people in this region who are doing amazing learning work? Um, and so I, I would invite that um, for you to come up to me after this talk, and, and we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, but when I was thinking about mass and preparing for this, I was like, wow, we really have a lot of stories that we haven't, that we have record of, but maybe not exactly a map of, and how do we think more intentionally about that? Um, and so the website is full of maps, is full of information, is full of data points, um, and we're constantly figuring out, you know, from a network perspective, as folks who don't do any youth work, but who are working and supporting so many educators who are doing beautiful, incredible work like all of you in the region, um, how do we do that better? How do we continue to map better? How can we really pull that out as something that the network is um, both able to do and also um, could do a little bit better as we move forward. So um, mostly because you all are kind of advanced remake learners and know a lot about what the network already is, I just kind of wanted to come up here and say, these materials on the website, if you don't already know about them, and these materials also need a lot of work to be more intentionally inclusive, to be more intentionally um, broad and diverse and, and helpful to people, and so also seeking for all of your help in that process. So. Um, I think that's it. I'd be really interested to hear, A, if you have any questions about any of this, but B, you know, if you could come to me and tell me what this brings up for you or how we can do any of these things better, I'd appreciate it. Um, but I really, I, I've been really thinking a lot since Lisa asked me to do this about what maps we produce, what is the capacity of a network to produce maps, um, and how we can continue to do that better. So that's all I wanted to say. I hope you enjoy the fair. I hope you enjoy the day. Um, it seems like it's been a really beautiful one, so thank you for having me. all available online about how the, I thought I heard you say the out of school time space. Well, both. No, neither or. Either just in general because, yeah, I just would like to see the transparency as a priority. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, don't apologize. All of our funders are on the website, too, speaking of mapping. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, that like, makes sense. You know, like, is this selling or is this, or is this teaching is what my question was. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of selling. We'll move into like the next couple of hours. I think that these are great things to kind of put down um, on our common boards and places to kind of reflect on and, and provide that that feedback and we can keep um, adding that into the conversation as well. Yeah. Um, because I do think that some of it is about helping people find each other and connect. And the more that we can be apparent where we're connected and where we're not and what we need to do, that's that's the main role. Right. It's also so, something though it was put out as a community and. This time, a lot of the speakers did stay the whole time, but some didn't. So when you're talking about building a community, 
and people just seem to be coming just to speak and not to be part of a community. Yeah, well, that's good that feedback for us, actually. I appreciate that. <coughs> and then we do have the next couple of hours to be able to pull more of that um, and to have those moments for the community to um, community members to have that ideas. So we very much welcome that. So I'm going to say a big thank you again to everyone who's been here for lunch. I just want to join me in a round of applause for everyone who's been I'm sorry, yeah, I share that question too. Oh, I'm sorry, Shmira. Are you guys aware of the website in multiple languages? That's a really good thought. We, the Renee Learning Days website was in about seven languages this year, and we have it. It's on that for the Renee Learning website. Um, I'm actually going to put that in a note right now for our team meeting on Monday, and we'll talk about it. Thank you, Shmira. Sorry, any other questions? Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you.